I've been watching the wheel for a month now. That's the name that I've given this monstrosity. The wheel. I saw it for the first time on one of my night walks with my dog, Benny. Beyond the edge of the town and out down by the fields and the forest. It was hard to see at the beginning, in the darkness. I mistook its body for a fallen tree at the edge of the woods. Benny noticed it before me anyway, or felt it at least. He stopped and stiffened, tensed and focused. Benny made the mistake of investigating the nest of a hive of yellow jacket wasps once. He got an awful sting on his nose, and he developed a hatred of anything even slightly resembling that nest that we find on our travels. His reaction here made me first think that he had found some such object. What is it, boy? I murmured to him, but he wasn't looking down at the ground. He was staring right out into the field, growling softly from the back of his throat. I remember this feeling of... of cold, just slithering sickly over my skin. I remember crouching by the hedge and peering through looking out on the farmland and following his gaze, at what I first thought was this fallen tree, stuck in the ground at an unusual angle, with branches outstretched and overlapping. I remember a feeling of terrible, icy dread drop like a stone into my stomach as the fallen tree shifted and adjusted its branches in that cool, windless night. My eyes grew used to the darkness, and the moon drifted out from behind a cloud, and the thing was washed in a faint, silvery light. I could see it a little clearer. Massive, you must understand. The size of an elephant, I guess, though far more scrawny and spindly. I still shiver thinking about seeing it that first time, watching it rising up onto all fours. It sickened me then, as it does now, even before I knew what it was capable of. I didn't dare speak, but I kept a warning hand on the back of Benny's neck. Stay boy, stay low and stay quiet. How to describe the wheel's body? Picture the werewolf if you can, from Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. My nephew loves that movie. A bizarre reference perhaps, but that's the best way that I can think to describe it. Large, hunched and hairless, stretched over animalistic bones, though more metallic looking. I don't know, rusty almost. And its head, the creature's head, its namesake. The monster's head is scarcely a head at all. Imagined if you will a huge layered wheel again metal looking, and ringed with dozens of minuscule looking amber lights. Benny and I watched as the creature crept through the night to the edge of the farmland. We watched as it leapt back on its haunches, with a low creak and looked up to the nearest tree, a pine I think. We watched as the great wheelhead began to spin, slowly at first and then faster, with a sound like a rising wind. The wheels within wheels began to rotate around and around, until they were nothing more than a blur. The lights that ringed it burst into a fiery intensity, and the pine tree found itself caught in a beam of brightening orange light. I stared in confusion and awe, heart pounding as the tree began to grow, rapidly, right before my eyes. And up it went up into the air, the branches creaking and cracking with duress as they sprouted with a surprise from the sides of the trunk. As the pine needles burst from the rents and fell to the floor in a constant rain, ever growing and ever falling, and still the tree climbed taller. Up, up it went, far up high beyond its brothers. The tree's groans and cracks grew louder and louder, but the wheel scarcely adjusted its position. I remember watching the monster's ribs shift, its silver stomach bulge as its head span around and around. 
The tree grew upwards for about a minute before it grew no further. And not long after that, the needles stopped falling too. No new leaves were grown, and the wood began to rot and the bark began to split. Though still the wheel held the tree in its gaze, the branches drooped and dropped from the trunk. The tree began to stoop and waver, groaning under the stress, until at last its roots gave out and it tumbled to the side, crashing loudly into its neighbor and resting there, dead, as its base began rotting away. Only then did the wheel's head begin to slow. The lights dimmed and the creature took a measured, careful step back. It waited perhaps a moment or two more for the spinning to cease and the lights to fade in, then that was it. I watched it look around and then bound away across the fields on heavy feet, disappearing into the shadows at the edge of the forest. That was all that it took. All it took for me to become obsessed. Obsessed with the beast. How could I not be? Benny always knew where to go. He seemed to sense which of our walks would be wheel hunting walks beforehand. His whole demeanor was always totally different. He's normally such a happy and carefree guy. But the nights that we went after the wheel, it's like he could sense their importance. So, just under a week after the first incident, and several sleepless nights spent attempting fruitless research, we found the creature again, Benny and I, a few miles south of its previous spot, at the edge of a field filled with sheep. The moon was not so bright that night. The air was still at first, but I still recall the sudden fright I felt at seeing the shadowed rim of the wheel rise up from the ditch at the edge of the field. Merged for a second with the shadows of the broken wooden fence, and then climbing up and above, clambering over and into the night, its limbs long, that circle of lights brightening and slowly is starting to spin, and then faster and faster. It's alright Benny, stay low boy, I murmured in a wavering voice as we watched, crouched from our position nearby. Most of the sheep awoke and fled, bleating as they bounced clumsily across the field. But one poor creature did not. Caught in the beam of the wheels, a brightening light and frozen in place. We could only watch as the light grew stronger still. As the wheels spanned faster and faster and the monster drew hungrily closer. We watched as the wool began to burst from the sheep's body. Grain and billowing out as the creature's ears began to droop. As its horns grew out from its head at an impossible rate. We watched as the sheep was enveloped in its wool and eventually it collapsed to the ground. Down into the dead grass it fell as a pile of wool and bones. And only when it was a little more than dust did the wheel pull back and allow the spinning of its head to slow. I ducked instinctively as it seemed to pass its gaze over our position in the shrubbery. It's difficult to tell where the creature is looking at. The only clue is that circle of lights. It didn't come after us though. It seemed to enjoy the sheep more than the tree. As it went after three more that night before disappearing. It came back the next night too and took some more. Though on the third night, I found myself warned away by an angry farmer. Two of his vehicles positioned in the field with floodlights blaring. Benny and I didn't see the wheel that night, or the night after that. But then, at the end of the week, Benny caught the wheel scent yet again. All of our walks were in pursuit of the wheel by this point. I was losing sleep over the monstrosity, but I had to see it again get some proper footage or something. My phone doesn't record so well in the dark, but I have an old camera that might do the trick. I swear that it has a setting specifically for night. So out we went, out into the night. We didn't leave the town this time, just to the outskirts. We walked for the better part of an hour and passed a homeless man, leant against the side of a building. Bare feet stretched out over the cobblestones, 
as the drizzle began to patter down all around us. Evening, he nods to me and I nod back. I pause at the sound of a noise from the far end of the street, but it's only a group of kids, teenagers I guess, drunk and stumbling home from one of the local bars. Benny stops beside me too though, fur risen and ears pinned back, and the homeless man seems to notice. No, oh, they're not a bad group of lads, you know, he chuckles. They often have money left over at this kind of time. It's why I'm still awake after all. Nothing to be afraid of, in fact. Quiet, I hiss to him, all of a sudden, and then, sorry, but please, shh. The man raises an eyebrow at me, but does as I say as I suddenly drop to the ground, peering out down the street from behind a nearby bin. What the? He mutters, following my gaze as the lads shout and laugh their way up the street. Behind them, clamoring down the side of a building in the rain, is the wheel. Avoiding the direct glare of the street lamps, it creeps its way over the road like an enormous spider, watching its prey down below. I'm telling you, mate, I could've got with her. One of the guys blurts out as his friends start laughing. His speech is slurred and one of them still carries a bottle in his hand. She had a boyfriend, mate. Didn't you see that guy at the bar? Another manages to choke out through laughter. Though the laughing stops the second, the wheel's shadow falls long and dark across these stones and puddles before them. What the... The sound of the wheel's spin rises swiftly and suddenly, like a wind. The head of the beast becomes a quick blur and the lights around the rim begin to brighten. The lads look up. Jesus Christ! In a frenzied panic, they start stumbling and staggering in different directions off the road. Chaos sets in. I can feel the tension of both my dog and the homeless man tighten beside me. The shock and the sheer disbelief. I remember what I'm here for and I start fumbling with my camera. Johnny! One of the lads shouts above the sound of the wheel and the wash of the rain. But the boy in the middle, the one with the bottle, is caught in the center of the road in the amber glare of the creature's beam. His eyes are bright and terrified with the light's reflection and with mouth open. It looks as if a scream is caught in his throat. Uh, help. He stutters before his jaw is locked in place. I struggle with the camera. Oh, we gotta help him. The man beside me mutters, hand on my shoulder. But what could we do? What is there to do? One of the boy's mates sprints off into the night. The other shouts and panics, hands on his head. But the wheel has its prize. I watch as the lights brighten and the wheel spins faster, as the boy grows a little taller and fills out. I watch his hair burst from his head, and I watch as creases and wrinkles appear across his face. The skin on his arms start to loosen and the color of his hair begins to gray. His jaw trembles. He looks as if he's trying to speak as a tear rolls down the side of his face. The crow's feet aside his eyes deepen and darken, and he is forced to a stoop as the rain falls. Sir, please, what can we do? The homeless man hisses, shaking me, but I don't respond. There's nothing we can do. We can't help this boy now. A sob escapes the victim's throat, caught in the sounds of the rushing wind, and he closes his eyes one final time. His friends have all gone now. I don't know where to. I watch as he exhales and collapses to the ground with a crunch. And still the wheel draws his energy. His body convulsing and twitching until he has crumbled to a skeleton. And then, as with the sheep, to dust. Already washing across the stone in the rain. The lights of the wheel start to fade. Its spinning slows and the targeting beams fade away. Silence, but for the gentle patter of the rain. The ancient camera at last is finally roused to life. Da-da-da-ding, it proudly proclaims, a digital jingle. 
loud in the strained tension of the street. Too loud, actually. Far too loud. Benny jumps at the sound, and he's not the only one. To my utter horror, the wheel, still balanced between buildings and perched above the street, swings around its monstrous head, right towards our position with a terrible creak, and the lights reignite. Crap! Benny barks. The homeless man swears and staggers back up against the wall, splashing in a puddle that is formed beside us. Terror strikes me. Run, I shout. And with Benny at my heels, we run down the street and race around a corner, sending up great splashes as we do so. Help, wait! The homeless man cries out from behind me, and as I round the corner, I shoot a look back over my shoulder. I watch in dismay as he falls to the ground and thuds against these stones with a grunt. I watch as he is caught in the beam. His eyes meet mine, and I hear that terrible whirring, both eerily metallic and yet natural at the same time. The rising wind. I see the shadow of the beast creep into position from around the corner. Don't, don't leave me, mate. The man pleads in a hoarse voice, but it is already too late. He reaches out a hand to try and lift himself off the ground, and then suddenly he freezes. The air above and around him shimmers in orange. I watch as he starts to shale, as his eyes roll back and a tooth loosens from his gums, falling to the stones with a clatter, as his fingernails lengthen and hands become wrinkled and spotted. I... I'm so sorry, Gemma, he whispers before his lips crack still. A moth flutters into the beam and disappears before my eyes into powder. Benny is barking, and I become aware that I have stopped running. I am standing and staring aghast as the man on the ground takes his final ragged breath. Benny bites at my sleeve and pulls and the spell is broken. I watch as the man dissolves into bones with a quick, sad sigh, and I turn tail and run, running through the streets around corner after corner, as far away from the wheel as we can, heading roughly back in the direction of the house. Back to my lane, back inside, slamming the door shut tight, I collapse against it, falling to the floor with my head in my hands. Jesus, oh crap, oh crap. What do I do? What the heck do I do? It's been a week now since our last encounter with the wheel and I still see that night in my dreams. The crumbling and disintegration of the people in the streets. The glare of the monster. Benny rests his hand in my lap, looking up at me with those big eyes of his, and I scratch him behind the ear. You know, don't you boy? You ready to go out again? He barks softly and I rise from the desk. I grab from the side my latest purchase, a high-intensity LED floodlight, a massive thing in the weight of a brick, but it's bright all right, it's bright as heck, and the wheel hates the light, that's what I've assumed at least. I need to stop jumping into these situations so carelessly, I need to think more, be a little more rational, have a bit more of a plan. I fasten on my coat and crouch down to my dog. You ready, boy? He looks at me panting, and with a deep breath, I lead us out onto the street. I'm nowhere near as confident walking at night as I used to be. Benny leads us through the deserted streets, sniffing his way through the darkness. A faint mist hangs unwanted around the edges of lampposts in the distance and clings to the base of the buildings. As we head further and further through the town, I find myself startled by every shifting shadow, every miscellaneous noise. Come on, I mutter to myself, get it together. But it won't be far now, Benny's gotten so good at following the subtle trail the wheel leaves behind. Benny stops and whines a little, and quickly I lead us to a nearby skip to use as a cover. A moment or two later, a figure, a shadow at first, and then more clearly, a girl, 
comes walking up from the mist and down the street. She has her headphones in, walking alone, her footsteps falling in time to some unheard song. This will be the wheel's target. Benny has begun to growl, and I see the collapsing bodies of the boy and the homeless man in my mind's eye. My heart rate increases and I start to sweat, despite the chill in the air. It's going to happen. It's all going to happen again. I hear the man's voice in my head. We gotta help him. Sir, please, what can we do? And I realize that I have to do something. What's even the point of these exhausted midnight excursions if I'm not going to do something? Hey, I call out, with a hand cupped around my mouth. Psst, hey! But the girl can't hear me. She walks right by on the opposite side of the road, humming quietly. She hasn't even seen me. Nor has she seen the looming shape through the shadows behind her. A towering behemoth, rising up and out of the mist. A long limb stretched out far to grab a hold of a nearby building's emergency exit staircase, creeping as it did before her, hungrily watching its prey. Though it moves with less care this time, it makes more of that creaking, metallic noise as it clamors. Has it grown less cautious in its hunts, more feverish for the taste of a human life? My voice catches in my throat. I can't call out now, I just can't. It'll hear me and it'll take me instead. And the lights around the rim of its enormous head start to intensify. It's happening. My eyes dart from the head of the beast to the oblivious girl, alone and foolish on her late night walk. The wheel tightens its grip on the side of the building right by me, and dust crumbles from beneath its claws to the street as its namesake starts to spin. Faster and faster, and the worrying grows louder. The girl finally notices something is amiss as her shadow multiplies and splits right beneath her feet. She turns to look up and behind her in confusion, and her mouth falls open in horrified shock. The orange of the fiery glare of the wheel is caught in her eyes and she is trapped. The wheel leans hungrily down towards her, as she begins to age right before my eyes. She grows in height, right through her twenties as dark circles appear beneath her eyes. Creases deepen between her eyebrows as she stares with horror at the source of the lights. And the light of my own ignites with a burst of dazzling sun. A white, bright beam swung round and up into the face of the monstrous wheel. I would have thought of something cool to say, had I not been literally shaking with fear as I burn the floodlight into the wheel, its own lights falter at once, and with its head spinning, it disengages its target and it scurries backwards, a low and disturbing metallic shriek echoing from its head as the girl, now woman, crumples to the ground, groaning. Back! Get back! I bellow, finding my voice at last as it knocks chaotically into the nearest wall sending shards of crumbling brick raining down. On heavy feet and claws, it staggers back and turns, hastening away into the night, away from the intensity of the beam and into the safety of the shadows. Still trembling and not daring to turn off the floodlight's glare, I go to join Benny, already sniffing around the girl in the street. Hey, I say to her, hey, are you alright? We've got to get you out of here. She raises her head at me, and propping herself up on an arm, she shakily takes out her headphones. What, what was that? She murmurs, and then seems surprised at the sound of her own voice. I feel, I don't know. She clears her throat, distressed. Something's off. She winces as she climbs up to her feet, looking down at her hands. Her fingernails reach out far from the ends of her fingers, though she had broken a couple in the fall. What the heck is going on? She whispers, and my heart goes out to her. How old is she now? How much time has been taken from her? I'm sorry, I mutter, 
And what else is there for me to say? What do you say to someone in a situation like this? The sound of the worrying is returning. I can't see it, but I can hear it. Benny barks and growls. It's alright, Benny. It's okay. I grab the woman or the girl by the collar of her coat. You have to go, alright? Get out of here. If it catches you in its light, it ages you, you hear me? It takes years from your life until you're nothing but bones. It... it what? She looks down at her hands again, turning them over. It ages you? I give her a starting shove as a shadow creeps around the roof of a nearby building. I swing the floodlight up towards it and it disappears for a second time, slinking back into temporary shadow. Go. And to her credit, finally, she dies. I hold out until she has vanished from sight and then I break for it too. I retreat down a nearby alley, panting and waiting and listening close. I don't want the wheel to know where I am so I switch off the floodlight, blinking as I try to force my eyes to readjust to the darkness. It's here that I finally catch my breath. It clouds and fogs before me as I listen as intently as I can for the sounds of the wheel. What's even my plan here? Keep it out in the open until sunrise. What am I expecting to happen? Where does it go and where does it go during the day? We have to keep following. I need to know where it goes, where its hideout is. So, mustering all of my courage, I leave the relative safety of the alley and continue on down the street, keeping close to the shadows. Benny leads me through the town and out back to the fields. We walk for most of the night, he and I, and I can tell that he's getting tired. I mean, heck, I am too. But we have to know where it goes. Benny seems to lose the scent a few hours into our quest. I check my watch with tired eyes. 4.35 a.m. Jesus. We're out by the fields. Not these same ones as before. There's no sheep here. Just a rusty old scrapyard and a disused barn. It's morbidly tempting. But I refrain from checking the barn tonight. I just can't bear it. So I resolve to try again tomorrow. Come on, boy. I say, stifling a racking yawn. Let's go home. I'm back in bed once the sun has risen and the birds have begun their morning chirps. Benny and I sleep till late afternoon and I awake feeling groggy and exhausted. I can't keep going on like this. I push myself through a day of work, grimly trying to recoup the lost time before it gets noticed. But my thoughts are all on the night. On the next night, on scoping out that barn, on drawing attention to the monster and driving it out for good. I find myself doodling in the margins of my notes, watching the hands on the clock tick by. The slow, crawling passage of time. I will it to go faster waiting for the sun to set and the night to fall. Come on, hurry up. Why can't the time go just a little bit faster? As it always does, however, the day draws to a steady close. I've been ready for hours, but when midnight strikes, I am out the door in an instant. Camera around my neck, floodlight held in one hand. Come on, Benny, I say. There's a good boy. And out we go, out into the darkness. I want to head straight to the fields and straight to the barn, but Benny has other ideas. He keeps barking and trying to lead me back to the scene of the attack last night. Come on, boy, no, we're headed back to the barn. But he won't budge, and eventually I relent, following along as he hurries back across the cobblestone streets and between the buildings to the road where the wheel had struck the girl. What are we doing here, Benny? I murmur, as Benny comes to a stop, looking out over the street, tail wagging. I squint and see at the far end, a figure stood beneath one of the street lamps, a silhouette. Checking carefully around for signs of the wheel, though emboldened by Benny's relative chill, 
I walk out down the street and towards the figure. As we draw closer, it turns to us, and I recognize her at once as the girl from the previous night. Oh, thank God, she mutters as she marches towards me, taking me by surprise as she grabs me by the collar and stares angrily into my face. Benny barks at her, but she ignores him. Her eyes, her eyes are the same, but the face that I look back into now, the face I see clearly in the light, is a woman in her late 30s, maybe early 40s. What happened to me? She shouts, and already the tears start to fall. She loses her composure almost at once and releases me, crying softly into her sleeve. How do I go back? What do I have to do to go back? I run a hand through my hair with pity. I'm sorry, I tell her. I don't think... I don't think there is a way to go back. She sniffs and wipes a hand across her face and she looks back at me. I've literally had the worst day of my life, you know, she says. I say nothing. All the problems I was faced with yesterday, whether or not my boyfriend likes the other girl, what I'm going to study at college, lyrics for the song I was trying to write, and the gift that I was going to get for my mom's birthday. She forces a humorous laugh. All meaningless now. My friends and family don't recognize me, and why would they? I would kill to get back the problems I was doing with yesterday. But yesterday is gone. She looks at her hands again. It's not fair. I feel so much older. It's just not fair. I want to back. I want to go back. Benny nudges her leg, and she smiles sadly, scratching his head. She sighs. He's a nice dog. What's his name? It's Benny, I reply, and she nods. I'm Celia, by the way. It's nice to meet you, Celia. Ben. Ben? That's right. She cocks her head at me. But isn't that your dog's name? No, his name is Benny. And she laughs for real now. It's a nice sound, though it's broken by a snort of amusement. You named your dog after yourself? What kind of person does that? I didn't name him after myself, dang it. I got him from a shelter. He already had the name when I found him. Ah, I see, I see. She grins down at Benny, his tongue lolling happily. It's still very funny, though. Hmm. She scratches his head a little longer. So, enough chit-chat. How do we kill it, Ben? How do we kill the monster? Kill it. Listen, this thing is the most dangerous. She cuts me off. Do I look like I care? I have nothing left you here. I have nothing. Her eyes shine in the light of the street lamp. So, I'm telling you now that I'm here to kill it. Whatever it takes. And so, with a sigh, I gesture her to come with us. And Benny now leads us the way that I had expected him to sniffing the stones and taking us out to the edge of town, towards the fields, and the abandoned barn. I tell her what I know. The wheel, that's what I've been calling it. It seems like it has to stay more or less in the same position while it eats, and it takes a moment or two to warm up too. But once you're in that light, you're caught. You're stuck. What's its weakness? I don't know about weakness, but it hates the light. Other than its own, obviously. It avoids these street lamps and the sun. And it hates this thing. I lift the floodlight. That's how I scared it off last night. Is that it? Just a light? Anything else you've learned at all? What is the light, do you think? The light that the wheel makes itself. I shrug as we leave the town behind us. It's another silvery moonlit night. I don't know, I'm sorry. I don't know much at all, really. It can eat trees and plants as well as animals. Insects, too. Trees, plants, she repeats. Insects? Yeah, same method. It just focuses the beam and takes the life of its target. She rubs her chin in thought. So it targets insects and plants. Well, no, they just got caught in the beam grass around the feet of a sheep. 
a moth that flew into the light, that kind of thing. Her eyes light up. So the beam isn't all that focused then, is it? If it kills anything caught in the light. I consider this. We climb the fence at the edge of the dark field and carefully and quietly make our way across the grass towards the barn. And Benny starts to whine, ears pinned back. All right, she whispers to me as we approach. I have a plan, but I never get to hear it. From behind us, from the scrapyard nearby, there comes the sound of twisting metal and creaking machinery. Benny near enough jumps out of his skin with a yelp, and I do essentially the same. Lights rise up from the clutter and a long, silvery arm reaches out to provide leverage. As the body and the head of the wheel rise up from the wreckage, it whirs with menace as the lights blink into life and the great head starts to spin. It clambers down the hill of junk towards us with a sickening speed that I had not yet seen from the behemoth. Benny races forwards to face it, barking loudly and angrily, teeth bared. Benny! I call out in a panic. My companion's shadow sent out long and dark across the grass, now illuminated orange. Benny, heal! Come back, boy! The wheel raises itself up, angling its light down to Benny, and I sprint towards him, all fear temporarily forgotten as I rush up to grab him. He's not a little dog by any means, and I grunt with the exertion, but I haul him up and fling him out to the side, to the safety of the shadow as I find myself caught in motion. A fly in resin, eyes wide, my body stiffens, and I'm just about able to turn my head to look up into the wheel's almighty gaze as it starts to draw from me my life force. Paradoxically, everything slows. Is this it then? I think to myself. I feel the passage of time as water rushing swiftly over my body. Waves of warmth and ice wash alternatingly across my skin as I feel it tighten in places and loosen in others. My wisdom teeth ache with sudden throbs of pain as they push themselves through the backs of my gums. The joints in one of my hands start to seize. I can feel my fringe growing long down my face and into my vision. Did I lead a good life? Did I do enough? Is this all of my fault? My obsession? My obsession has done this. It has taken my time from me. Time that I can surely never recover. But my thoughts are interrupted by a sudden shriek from above, and I catch a blur of motion through the darkness. Celia leaves from the roof of the barn and, like a madwoman, down onto the wheel's back. I cannot see what it is exactly that she holds, but it is sharp, and it is metal. And she hacks into the monster's neck, eyes wide and burning with fury. The wheel creaks and cries out with a metallic distress call, the lights are faltering, and with a crack it tears away its gaze, leaving me gasping in the darkness, clutching my chest and looking down to my hands. How much did it take? A decade perhaps, or a little bit more. I look back up, Benny is barking and gnawing at the wheel's legs, the monster itself swings its head around from side to side furiously trying to shake off the attacker on its back. I return to my senses and I grab the floodlight, switching it on with a blast of light and aiming the beam at the monster. It recoils with frustration, but alas, Celia is knocked from its back and down to the ground. She doesn't give up, though. She immediately grabs a hold of one of the wheel's legs, stabbing her weapon in as deep as it'll go and keeping a firm grip on the handle. The wheel in its rage looks down to its feet. The great spinning head starts whirring around and around, and Celia is caught in the intense orange glare. As indeed is the wheel itself. Heal, Benny, I call out, and this time he does, running towards me, but still looking back at the scene in the field. Celia's hair starts sprouting from her head, graying and thinning and falling to the ground. Her lips start to wrinkle. The lines aside her eyes become deep and many, but still her bitter grip persists. 
she will not let the wheel go. The wheel makes noises that I've never heard before. The whirring of its head starts to grind. Rust and dust falls from its joints. Its posture becomes more hunched, and the color of its body begins to lighten and pale. Unaware of what it is doing to itself, or perhaps too caught in the frenzy to care. Celia, I call out, aiming the floodlight as best I can. But it isn't enough. At last, her grip is lost and she tumbles to the grass. The wheel screams with rage, drawing everything from her until she is nothing more than a cloud of dust to be lost in the wind. The wheel staggers away, limping, and away it goes, slower than before, far slower out of the darkness and retreat. It looks back at me and I raise my own weapon. I catch it in the fire of my own light, aimed right into the center of its horrible, monstrous head. Go to hell. I mutter as the floodlight buzzes with power, as the creature collapses. Down it goes under the grass, and there it disintegrates. Its body falls apart as if it were a toy dropped from a great height. A black oil-like substance spills out onto the grass, as the wheel and all the wheels within simply disconnect. They break apart. Some roll around a little before they drop, but drop they do, into nothing more than another pile of junk in the field. Silent, still, and lightless. I drop the floodlight and race to join Benny, but there is nothing here but dust blown out across a patch of dead grass. She was here, and in the blink of an eye, she was gone. I'm sorry, Celia. I murmur sadly into the night. I inspect the corpse of the wheel, if indeed it can even be called a corpse. Earlier, I had likened its body to a werewolf from afar, but now, up close and deceased, it looks like a discarded art project, just a rack, a gray pile of, of nothing, substanceless, really. Come on, Benny, I say to my friend. Let's go home, pal. I get more asleep these days. I still do my research, don't get me wrong, regarding the wheel, about whether there might be more like them out there. There are important questions that remain unanswered. But you'll be pleased to know that I do allocate my time more carefully. There is nowhere near as much. Waste of it. I have a little less of it than I did before, after all. And we ain't none of us getting it back. <laughs>